in the rest of these workshops, there will be several talks about the new results. In particular, I think there are two nice talks going to happen tomorrow, um, which in a sense are a modern continuation of some of the stuff that I'll talk about uh, today. Um, the thing I'd like to talk about first today is the so-called Frosser bound. Um, and um, it's in the literature also known as uh, the Frosser Martin bound, because Andre Martin uh, provided a very nice proof of this bound, which, um, which is, is much more um, general than and Frosser bound. Frosser made some assumptions, which, uh, with hindsight, may not be entirely justified. Um, exactly about the analyticity of the scattering amplitude. Martin does away with all that. Um, <clears throat> I don't have a whole lot of time to explain every little detail of this thing, so let me just say what Martin, let me just paraphrase, paraphrase what, what Martin said. Um, <clears throat> he said the following, um, let's consider a dispersion relation for um, a scattering amplitude, T of ST, um, which at infinity um, <coughs> may, be, uh, may blow up. So I uh, have to do some subtractions. And so let me take a dispersion relation for this scattering amplitude divided by S to the N, where, S, where N is sufficiently big so that, um, so that this thing falls off at, at infinity. Um, <coughs> Then you can do the usual trick, as we saw in the previous lecture, that to rewrite this thing as the imaginary part, as an integral of the imaginary part, S t, s prime t, divided, of course, by s prime to the n, s prime minus s, d s prime, and then there's the contribution for the u channel cut, for m squared minus s. So again, as you see here, I'm, I'm in this, um, picture where I have some analyticity where um, uh, so uh, so uh, for m squared minus s minus t so this is the, the su symmetry that we talked about earlier so you have some some cut at minus t and you have some cut at 4m squared and this is the analytic picture which we can sometimes prove for um, <coughs> for the scattering amplitude of course we cannot prove this for all t so um, let me assume that everything I said is valid for uh, some t, uh, for, for some range of negative t's. Um, <coughs> for positive t, you are, you're in a bit of trouble. So what I'm assuming here is something that we can prove in certain cases that this is valid for some range of negative t's, um, plus an extra assumption that this thing is polynomially bounded at infinity, that it doesn't blow up exponentially fast in any direction in the complex S-plane. This is also something that um, you can argue for based on, for example, the LSZ prescription, but I'm not going to review that. Then Martin said, well, we have these, this nice result, which you could prove, but we also have this Bose epstein glaser result, um, which says that this thing is locally analytic in both S and T. Uh, the analyticity in S here is manifest, but um, near every point where it's analytic in S, this is also analytic in T. In particular, for T equals zero, it's locally analytic in T. So it seems that this dispersion relation, which initially you proved for T less than or equal to zero, you may be able to extend it, and its validity um, may, it may, may be a bit bigger, and it may in particular be valid also for some range of positive T. Um, this is not obvious. And this is the part I'm going to skip because it requires a bit of trickery with analytic functions where, so you want to, for example, write a series expansion around t equals zero of this thing. So you take some derivatives of this thing and then what Martin has can claim is that you, or what he can prove is um, that you can take these derivatives inside the integral and nothing goes, goes wrong uh, with the convergence of this integral. So it's all a bit subtle, but in the end he, sho he shows that this is valid then if this is all true, then it's valid for, uh, for t greater than zero 
well, let me just write it like this, t less than t naught as well, where uh, t naught is some positive number. So this is what Martin said, and um, um, <coughs> you should compare this with the result of Lehman that we had in the previous lecture, where um, we had this ellipse in the cos theta plane, um, cos theta, I don't think, um, well, in, okay, any case, um, cos theta was this, we had this ellipse, and with s close to four, um, <coughs> we see that if theta is, is finite, cos theta basically has to blow up because this becomes very small, so this thing becomes very big, and I'm always outside the ellipse. So, um, <coughs> so that was a bit of a problem with the Lehman ellipse, but now Martin says, well, actually, in, um, if, I, if I use this trick, then I can show that there's a bigger regime of analyticity, namely also positive t for any s. So this was Martin's results, and all we'll use is then that the scattering amplitude is polynomially bounded. Um, if you assume what I wrote here, then Martin shows that the scattering amplitude is polynomially bounded for t um, less than t naught. So in practice, you can say something about t naught in some cases. For example, you can show that t naught um, <coughs> for pi pi scattering, it's, it's precisely the two particle threshold in the, in the t channel, as you would expect. Um, but then we can do some nice things because now I can just write my equation, absolute value of t of st. And these are very simple manipulations. So you, if t is sufficiently big, then uh, the imaginary part, is, uh, the absolute value is greater than the imaginary part. But then for the imaginary part, I can, um, substitute this partial wave decomposition of the imaginary part. And obviously, since um, the imaginary parts are all positive by um, this equation, it's a sum of positive terms. So let me just take a single term in that series, term number L, and then definitely what I wrote here is uh, greater than or equal to um, a single term in this, in this series, so a single term of, of L of S. Uh, PL of uh, cos theta, where cos theta is uh, 1 plus 2 um, T over S minus 4. And this is true for T less than T naught, so for T positive. But now um, I can use something about the Legendre's because the Legendre polynomial of uh, 1 plus T over s minus 4m squared for very, um, <coughs> well, it basically behaves like this. So these things grow exponentially fast with spin. And if you work out what uh, it looks like, it looks something like this. So this is true for uh, t greater than not 0. And of course, s is also greater than, than 4m squared. So you see, in particular, I have a color, um, this exponential growth with spin. Yeah, it's, it's large s, yes. So let me do a sim. Um, although maybe you can fiddle with the constants to make it true for all s. But the important bit, the thing that we're interested in is, is all s. Um, so since this is true, these things grow exponentially fast, but this thing needs to be bounded for all L. So essentially what you can show is that um, the partial wave has to, fall, have to fall off exponentially fast with L. So we have the imaginary part of the partial wave is less than C S to the N, right? I just used that equation again over root s divided by 2 plus 1. So that's interesting. We had a, um, a bound on the imaginary part. It's a little hard to see from this. But here, what I write is that um, 
the imaginary part of a number is greater than its modulus squared, if the number is up to, up to this, this simple factor, if the, mod, if the number is, is very big, that of course will never work. So this implicitly also is a bound on the imaginary part. And I claim that um, if the number is very big and, and, and pure imaginary, then it will never be bigger than its square, right? Um, <coughs> so uh, from the standard unitarity constraint, we also get that the imaginary part of FL of S uh, is less than or equal to 64 pi over S divided by S minus 4M squared. So you can see it if you read if you read it in this terms of this phase shift e to the two i delta sits in the unit disk and it's one plus i times f, so the imaginary part of f cannot go arbitrarily far away. Um, <coughs> so we have two bounds on the imaginary part of um, of the partial waves. Uh, one for very large spin, it falls off exponentially fast, and one sort of that that becomes constant at, at large s. So now the thing I want to do with this result, so this is in itself, I think, already a nice result. It tells you something very general about these uh, partial waves, how they should behave. Um, but what Martin, what Fosser did with this is um, he maximized the total, uh, cross, total cross section 2 to x. Um, <coughs> so let's maximize. Uh, for large s, uh, the total uh, cross section two to anything, which is of course um, from this, it looks a bit like uh, one over s, sum over l, one half, two l plus one. I'm not going to be bothered with the overall coefficient here, um, <coughs> which now I have a bound for. So let me split this sum into two parts. I'll do, um, oops. I'll sum from zero to capital L. And for low spins, yes. No, I, did sub I wrote a dispersion relation for t divided by s to the n. So that's a implicitly a subtracted dispersion relation. But maybe I didn't write it. Yeah, I wrote it in the integrand. No, no, you, you, you left it with a polynomial. So you, you left out. Oh, I left out the polynomial term. Right. Yes, yes, of course. Yeah, the singularity said, uh, in particular, there's the stuff at s equals 0. Um, is that to the L? PL is, is, uh, <coughs> PL is certainly polynomial. So how does it uh, get to be anything but large L? Large L, large L. I think it's a true fact about the genre polynomials no, that no, what no, I wrote. No, it's, it's about no, large L. No, okay, yes. Um, <coughs> good. So. Um, Let's go back here. We have this sum over all L. Um, for the first um, low spins, if I want to maximize this guy for the low spins, I, of course, use the, the 64 pi times something that goes to 1. Um, and then for the, not for the higher spins, at some point, um, <coughs> my exponential will kick in. And uh, I will have to say that this thing is 1 half 2L plus 1 times whatever I wrote there s to the n minus c double prime l over root s, and then divided by 2 l plus 1. So these two guys actually uh, cancel. I think I wrote this more or less correctly. Um, <coughs> and now my, if my aim is to maximize this guy, I'm going to pick this l such that um, the exponential kicks, it, kicks in as late as possible. Um, <coughs> And you see that these two terms become roughly of the same magnitude if I pick um, 
L very specifically. So what I'll do is, uh, uh, oh yes, this is fine, pick my capital L, my transition point, to be something like log s root s times some coefficient alpha, which depends a bit on this on this n, but it's not it's not particularly important. And then um, what you see is if you um, sum this bit, of course you get um, <coughs> the sum of L equals zero to capital L of something that's linear in L to leading order is, is uh, proportional to capital L squared, even if you sum over only the even uh, spins. Um, <coughs> so you get from the first bit that the total cross-section uh, is less than or equal to some constant uh, times log squared of s, because this square root squared cancels against this 1 over s here in the prefactor. And um, what you then get from the, sub from the second part of the sum is actually subleading. You can show. Um, it's not so hard to show that this is actually subleading compared to the leading bit. And so this is. Um, this thing just falls off uh, slower for, for large s. And so then you are done because this is now your upper bound on the total cross section um, at very, very high energies. The cross section cannot grow faster than uh, something like log squared of s. And this coefficient, if you had been more careful, um, unlike me, then uh, you would have been able to prove that this coefficient is uh, something like uh, 4 pi over t0, where t0 is this maximum uh, analyticity, um, <coughs> maximum uh, positive t that for which the dispersion relation must still valid. So uh, this is often the t-channel singularity, and some things you can actually say something about this coefficient. So. Um, T0 is, is infinite, then there is no scattering in the t-channel, right? Because it's analytic all the way. Sorry? There was a, I think I derived a, a log squared. This is also in, in, in agreement with experiment, which is the next thing I, I wanted to, to say. So um, let's let's talk a bit about about experiments. Experimentally, this this total cross section. So first of all, um, I showed you this plot of of pi pi scattering. Well, that's very nice, but those, if you remember, are fermions, and this is for bosons. So uh, that is um, a little dangerous. But you can actually extend this to particles with spin. Um, and although I haven't checked the proof, it seems that you get similar constraints for for spinning spinning particles. Um, but then you can ask whether this coefficient actually, which you, um, actually matches um, with, with experiment a bit. And in fact, the coefficient is way, way, way too big. So uh, it's very nice, this bound. But experimentally, um, although we seem with current uh, data to observe something that grows very slowly, that you could fit a log squared to, um, this coefficient is just way off. And uh, the bound is obviously obeyed, but it seems that uh, PP scattering is, is way below the, the Fossar, uh, Fossar bound. So um, <coughs> this was a nice result to come out of all this S matrix bootstrap stuff from the uh, 60s um, <coughs> and, and maybe 70s. So people have improved this bound in various ways. There are subleading terms uh, which you can uh, determine. Um, you can, uh, uh, to, to some extent, so for example, this should be log s over s0, where s0 is some constant. You can say something about this, this, this constant. Um, <coughs> people have looked at integrated bounds. Um, so for example, you do the integral of the total cross-section as a function of s, ds. Of course, this may diverge, so you divide it by some power. And then you get something finite, and people have looked at these kind of things, so you integrate over some finite window. And like I said, people have looked at um, particles with spin. They've looked at 
uh, non-zero t, t negative, um, um, where you just get a bound not on the cro total cross section but the imaginary part of the scattering amplitude, um, <coughs> and non-identical particles. Right? We are always looking at two to two identical particles, but you can uh, take a b going to anything, and, and for those you can also get similar looking bounds. Um, <coughs> Those are the improvements. Let me also mention two open questions. Um, or there's, there's, they are related. And, and one of them is probably not an open question. It's just that I was unable to parse the, the result. Um, the first question that you should ask if there's any bounds is uh, whether this can be saturated, whether you, whether you can cook up a scattering amplitude that obeys all the constraints and, um, <coughs> and actually saturates this bound with the known coefficient. And uh, there are people in the literature, um, there, there, there are papers that, uh, that claim that this bound can be saturated, but these papers were very, very difficult to read. And whether they, there's not like a simple scattering amplitude as far as I could find in the, in the literature uh, that, just, that I can just give to Mathematica and try to see if, the, if everything thing works. But maybe I should study a little bit harder. And if you ask me again in a few weeks, I may be able to, to answer this question. So this is a question, this is an open question just for me, probably not for people who, are, who know more about this, this kind of stuff. Um, a more important and, and truly open question is, um, is the fact that we just use the unitarity constraint as an inequality. Um, but we know, if you remember from the first lecture, that unitarity um, is often saturated. This equation is saturated for a finite window of S starting from threshold for M squared to something like 9 M squared or another uh, to some inelastic threshold. And we didn't use that. So um, <coughs> a big open question is whether this bound can be improved if you um, use the saturation of this, um, this bound, something that I, I can call the elastic unitarity condition for a finite window of S. And I don't think, um, um, I, I don't think uh, people really understand how, how you can take this into account. It's obviously a big constraint on the scattering amplitude. And, and what it would do for this cross section, total cross section, people don't really know. Yes, please. Okay. So you say, let me let me try to repeat this for the recording. Uh, you're saying it's not clear whether the, what happens to the bound, whether it, it may go away if the, if. Yes, it's no, it's okay. I understand. So you're asking whether the, an open question is whether the bound would go away in the in the limit where you take the massless the particles to be massless. Yes, that's okay. Right, um, and massless particles, of course, are. Maybe, although Gavro perturbation theory should. I mean, you're, you're asking. We are saying something about high energies here, right? So I'm not sure if you can use low energy effective theory. Okay, uh, thank you. So, um, yeah, I'm also not sure what happens in the, in the massless limit. 
And in particular for pion scattering, of course, you want to interpret this as scattering of Goldstone bosons. <coughs> yes? Ah, very good. You're asking whether there's a, a corresponding bound in, in three dimensions, or more generally, in any dimension. I think there's a corresponding bound. I don't know, know it by heart. But uh, of course, the unitarity constraints look a little bit different. I think um, I, I may be able even to point you to a paper after the lecture where they um, find, uh, look at the three-dimensional bounds. Um, well, it's log squared s over s naught, right? So uh, there, 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 is, there are going to be log s corrections as well, so, so I think. Growing, yes, I think the subleading terms may also grow. Yes. In three dimensions, you're guessing it's one log. OK, because that's fine. It's the area of the right. This ties a bit into to what I said yesterday about this being some kind of effective radius of this black disk, which is supposed to grow like, like um, root as, as log s. Although the black disk model was slightly different, because here we're sitting uh, for low spins not exactly at the center of the of the disk in, in phase shift world, the e to the 2i delta. Yesterday, I set it to 0 for low spins. And here, we're not setting it to 0. <coughs> we're sitting at the other end of the, of the, of the disk. <coughs> so yes? Sorry, is the bound also uh, obeyed in the CFD, right? Ah, very good, because we're talking, yes. Um, I don't know. I will, like, what would you say for CFTs? There are all kinds of. Sorry? The question was whether this bound is also obeyed for CFTs. But for CFTs, I'm not sure I can define a scattering amplitude um, non-perturbatively. And that's the, that's the realm in, in which I'm, I'm working. In ADS? Oh, oh of course. Um, yes, that's a whole different seminar that there's some connection, obviously. Um, well, not obviously, but there's some connection um, between um, correlation functions in ADS, um, <coughs> correlation function of operators in ADS, where I, I take some, I have some ADS space times, which you should know about by now, and I take some correlation functions of, of some operators that sit at the boundary, and I send in some stuff, and there's some event happening here. And this event somehow should be, if I, if I make ADS very, very weakly curved, this event should somehow be related to a scattering amplitude, right? It's, it's the same physical picture. And, and making that precise is, is, is something that, uh, that we worked on a bit and, and um, following results by, by many people, in particular Mark and, and Joao and, and, and um, uh, Steve Giddings also looked at this. Yeah. Uh, but that's not something for, for today, unfortunately. Um, now I wanted to discuss two things. I'm, of course, behind schedule because that's what uh, I seem to be doing all the time. So uh, I wanted to uh, discuss Reggie theory and Pomeranchuk's theorem. Um, let me start with Reggie theory, which is a bit more interesting. If there's time, then I'll, um, I'll discuss Pomeranchuk's theorem as well. Unless there are any more questions about uh, Fossar bound. So um, this will be the lightning version of uh, lightning review version of Reggie theory. I'm really not going to give you um, much information here, but just the essential bits. Uh, let me say that I hope this is sufficient so that you can all understand the talks that will be given tomorrow. That's that's. Let, let me say that that's my aim here. Um, without, I hope it's tomorrow, right? Amit and Simon. So what's roughly the idea? Um, well, we've made the momenta complex 
But there's one more parameter here, um, which is the spin. So the idea is to complexify spin. And um, this is not an entirely crazy idea. If you look at, for example, the Schrodinger equation, after you've, um, for some spherically symmetric potential, you can, of course, separate uh, variables. And then for the radial bit, you get an equation that just involves L times L plus 1. And this parameter L sits there, and it's just a differential equation. And you can ask what this differential equation, what the solutions to this differential equation look like for complex L. And you find some, um, some, some interesting uh, way of, of, of looking at, for example, the hydrogen atom that I'm also not going to discuss here. So that's sort of where this picture comes from, from quantum mechanics and spherically symmetric potentials. Um, and then you can ask, can I do this for quantum field theory? So, OK, let me be naive. And um, let me just write PL vax. Uh, so here I'm doing a little um, t minus 4 m squared, 1 minus x t. So let me try something like this. So notice I did. Um, one little trick here, which is I wrote the partial waves as a function of t and not of s. So I swapped um, um, s and the, the role of s and t here. This will be useful later because we'll use crossing symmetry. So you have to um, pick basically basically a s one, one version. Um, and, and this is the one that, that I'll stick with. Um, <clears throat> and now these Legendre uh, polynomials can be defined for any complex L. Um, they are no longer polynomials, but they can just be defined as some hypergeometrics. But the nasty thing about this is um, that these guys um, grows, grow exponentially with, with larger L, as we've seen. And uh, so that's a bit of a nasty thing, because eventually, so um, spoiler alert, we will try to write some kind of dispersion relations in this complex L plane. And if things grow exponentially, you have infinitely many um, subtractions, and it doesn't quite work. So this is bad, and this is why just using complex L in this picture is naive. <coughs> but we can do a little bit better. Um, <coughs> we can use um, <coughs> that we can use a dispersion relation and then a trick involving Legendre polynomials um, that um, translates, um, that, that gives you an equation like this, but then with Legendre functions of the second kind. And those are much better behaved. So what do I do? Um, I write a twice subtractions, subtracted uh, dispersion relation. So let me um, write it uh, like so. So a scattering amplitude. Um, for t less than t naught um, has a constant, a term that grows linearly, some poles, and then, um, <coughs> uh, of course, the familiar integral over the cuts, which um, uh, I can write as so let me put the subtraction points at S1 and S2. Um, there's a pi here. Integral from 4m squared, where my cut generally starts, um, ds prime imaginary part of uh, t s prime t. And then I have s prime minus s1, s prime minus s2. So those are the subtractions that I now move to the other side. Um, s prime minus s, d s prime. <coughs> so this is the, so um, this is the usual uh, dispersion relation. OK, there's also a, a left cut, but uh, by crossing symmetry, I can take them, take it, uh, map it to, to um, it's, it's basically the same uh, imaginary part for this scattering of identical particles. So I can just add a factor two, roughly speaking, and then 
I get an equation that looks a bit like this. Um, <coughs> and now I have this dispersion relation. Um, I'm going to plug in um, <coughs> this equation. But you see, um, well, it's a bit, um, yeah, let me write the trick that I'm going to use. So you, you plug in this, this, um, this sum over, over partial waves, and then you get PL of, of, of X, um, <coughs> but um, <coughs> let's see where the X is. Uh, <coughs> Um, S prime T. So, what I want to use is something like this, 1 over Z minus X. Um, and this equals QL of Z. Yes? I have on Sorry? Yes, I subtracted this twice because uh, basically of the of the Frasser band, roughly speaking. Although the Frasser band says something about the imaginary part growing with S, right? The total cross section is log squared. The imaginary part is then S times log squared. So then I should then I have two subtractions, and then I can um, I have to argue something about the real part. But we have said before that the real part is generically smaller. Than um, so that's why I can use two subtractions and I use this thing and if you do this correctly um, um, <coughs> ah okay that's what I need to do um, so um, right I, I said something wrong so I'm, I'm back on track sorry for this um, here is FL of T. Those guys I want to complexify. Here I want to complexify spin. So what I'll do, I won't substitute um, uh, the sum in that equation. Instead, I'll, I'll substitute the dispersion relation in this equation. That's what I'm supposed to do. And um, if I do that, then I get um, an integral of Legendre function of some polynomial of, of X, which comes from this um, polynomials in S divided by some polynomial in Z, where Z is this uh, S prime, and then uh, there's an S minus S prime, which is Z minus X. So here I transformed from, um, I, I secretly said X and S are basically the same thing, and that's just because S is linear in X, right? So it's just an overall factor that, that, that comes out here. So um, <coughs> that's why um, your integral uh, is of this form. And then I can get, um, FL of T being equal to uh, something like pulse plus 1 over pi times the integral of ds prime for m squared to infinity, uh, the imaginary part T of s prime T um, divided by T minus 4 m squared, which basically comes from this uh, change of variables between x and s. Um, and then I have QL now of 1 minus 2s prime over t minus 4m squared. And this is the so-called um, Frasser-Gribov representation. And you see what I did here is that I I wrote the t-channel partial wave, but I substituted um, a dispersion relation for, for s. And obviously, because of these subtractions, um, this is not always valid. It's only valid for a sufficiently large spin, where uh, this, this polynomial in s does not, um, um, <coughs> um, does not contribute. So um, this is valid for uh, L greater than or equal to two only. <coughs> this QL, uh, very good, is the Legendre function of the second kind. So it's the other solution to this Legendre differential equation um, of the second kind. It's not a polynomial. 
and um, <coughs> it uh, vanishes, importantly, as L goes to infinity, plus infinity. It has, uh, it has poles at negative integer L, but um, that's not something I uh, am too worried about here. I'm not sure what happens if you send L to infinity in this equation. Yeah. It, it may, it may sim look, look simpler. We better get something that vanishes exponentially fast, of course. So now what I do is, um, <coughs> in this equation, I take L to be some complex ver variable. So now I have something, this FL of T I now view as a function of two complex parameters, both L and, um, um, and T. So what happens in the complex L plane? Well, if you do quantum mechanics and potential scattering, then you can show that what you get in the L plane is actually poles at most. You don't get very, very nasty, complicated singularities. In quantum field theory, well, we sort of don't really know where to start even, so it's, it's very hard to say anything rigorous about what happens in the, in the complex L-plane. But let me just assume nice properties and see, see where this leads us. So in particular, the following observation is um, the standard result that you get from this uh, foissar gribov uh, representation, which is, um, <coughs> let me suppose that the imaginary part the scattering amplitude um, <coughs> goes like s to the power alpha of t as s goes to infinity for t fixed for some function alpha of t. <coughs> let me let this be valid in some window for both positive and, and negative t. <coughs> then what happens? Well. Um, we are going to look at very large S, so uh, let's see uh, what happens here. We have to look at the Legendre um, function of the second kind for very large S, so we see um, um, which um, you can look up vanishes as fast as uh, one z to the minus l minus one as z goes to infinity. And so uh, we get, if we make this guy complex, um, that um, FL of t behaves as an integral, looks a bit like an integral over S uh, prime times S prime to the power for very large S. Uh, we have this S prime to the alpha of t uh, minus L uh, minus one from the, from the QS. This is roughly what it looks like. But then, if I do this integral, I get a coefficient, which goes like, which looks a bit like one over alpha of t minus l. And clearly, when alpha of t is equal to l, this integral stops converging, and you get some singularity. So, and you can see that this singularity is just a pole. Um, <coughs> I.e., from this, you see um, that this behavior of the, of the imaginary part of the scattering amplitude um, leads to a pole in the complex L-plane at L equals alpha of t. And um, by assumption, um, since the integral should converge then um, for all um, larger values of, of L, um, this is sort of the, the rightmost singularity in the complex L-plane. And if there would be a further singularity, a singularity further to the right, that would mean that this integral would stop converging um, <coughs> um, for, for, for larger values of L, and then the behavior should be, should be different. So this is, by assumption, the first, um, um, the first pole, the rightmost pole uh, singularity in the complex L plane. Um, and note that this pole moves around. So if I vary t, then this pole that sits there somewhere in the L-plane is just going to move.
So that's part one. This behavior, assumed behavior of the scattering amplitude leads to a pull in the complex L plane. Just maybe a comment. Yes. This power, well, let's think about what Frasser means. Um, it says that the imaginary part grows approximately linear at t equals zero. That's the forward limit. So um, alpha of t is one, approximately. Alpha of zero is about one, or, or less than one. Right, so sorry for the recording. The question was what this, uh, how this is compatible with the Fasser bound. So the Fasser bound that I've proven for you was just that t equals one, uh, zero, and so the uh, Fasser bound just says something about alpha of zero, and the cross section grows like log squared of s. So um, the imaginary part goes like s times log squared of s, which is roughly speaking s. So roughly speaking, alpha of zero is um, equal to to one or or less. You can, you can get some logs also here, but uh, then everything, this also looks a bit more complicated. Um, but typically, you take t, t, t positive and along alpha, you get because Typically, I want to take um, t both positive and negative. So I want this to be um, true for, for some negative t, where I can make contact with the experiment, and also for some positive t, where um, I'll, I'll find the, the, the spectrum of resonances in a minute. So now, um, as I said, this was just part one. Um, now we write that the scattering amplitude um, well, I'm just going to um, use this this kind of equation, but um, since now my FL of t are the FL of x are defined um, FL of, of s, sorry. Uh, my FL of s are defined for complex L. I'm going to write this thing as this sum as some kind of uh, contour integral. So, for example, one thing I can do is I think I got the coefficients right here. One half two L plus one. FL of t, PL of x, PL of, of minus x, plus uh, divided by sine pi. So my claim is that this equation for suitable contour gives, is precisely equivalent to this sum. And the, the contour that I'm going to take here is in the complex L plane. Um, yeah. It's something that, that wraps around all these poles that sit here when L is an integer. And when L is an integer, um, I pick up this pole and I get a contribution uh, precisely for integer L, and that reproduces this sum. When L is an even integer, I get something, and um, factor two is off, but I hope I compensated for that. I get twice the, the genre polynomial. And when L is an odd integer, I still have a pole, but the residue vanishes because of the even oddness of this Legendre polynomial. More generally, if you don't scatter identical particles like I do here, then um, you need to basically complexify both for even L and odd L separately. But that's not a thing I'm, I wanted to discuss, uh, discuss here. So in the complex L plane, I have poles 0, 2, 4, also, well, no poles at, at the odd values of L, and of course also minus two, minus four. And my contour is going to be just this. Um, let me do it, do it in this way, uh, because then I think my sign comes out right. So this is um, my picture for uh, what happens in the complex L plane. And this also has a name, it's called the Sommerfeld. Watson transform. So now I'm going to combine these two pieces of information. So I have this supposed behavior and this pole that it leads to in the complex L plane. So there's some pole sitting here in the complex L plane. And um, 
let me for the moment take it complex just to draw a better, better picture, but you can also try to, um, it can also be real. So here's alpha of t, and uh, it just sits here, and if I vary t, this thing is just going to move in the, in the complex L plane. And by assumption, it's, um, it's the rightmost pole, so uh, other singularities just sit to the left of this thing, not to the right. So again, it's quite a bit of wishful thinking um, <coughs> and, and based on some assumptions, but the picture that we'll get in a second, I think makes it worth it. Because now what I'm going to do is, um, I'm of course going to open up this contour. I already said that this, um, these FL of t now fall off exponentially fast for complex L, so for large, pos large positive L in a complex plane. So my claim is that I can open up this contour, and instead of picking up all these poles and getting the sum out, I'm just going to pick up the pole here, sitting at alpha of t. <coughs> so um, if FL of t goes like um, something like a pole in the complex L plane. This is called a Reggie pole, by the way. Then obviously I can just pick it up and see what it contributes to the scattering amplitude. Then T um, <coughs> Well, let me, sorry, let me just write this as S and T now. S and T behaves as um, at least the contribution to the scattering amplitude of this pole looks like 2L plus 1, well, L is alpha of T. So that's 2 times alpha of T plus 1. There's the beta of T. There's the Legendre function, now not evaluated at L, but at alpha of T. Um, 1 plus 2s over t minus 4m squared um, plus p alpha t of minus that thing divided the whole thing by sine of pi alpha of t. So first zeroth order check is what happens at very large s holding t fixed, well, I get s to the power alpha of t. So um, at least that bit is, uh, is OK, that you can check from properties of the Legendre uh, functions for, for general L. Um, <coughs> but also, we see that this has poles. It's a scattering amplitude with a bunch of poles sitting at alpha t being an integer. Actually, it's an even integer because precisely of what I said before. And what are the, residue, the residues of these poles? When alpha is an even integer, you see that this is a, um, so this is a pole in the, in the t plane. When alpha is an, an even integer, you see that this is a polynomial in S. And um, this is not something I discussed before, but um, if you have a pole in the scattering amplitude, um, whose residue is a polynomial of degree L, then that corresponds to a bound state or maybe a resonance um, of a particle of spin L. So, um, <coughs> um, of course, the, the, the poles corresponding to bound states that we've seen before from just from the Feynman diagram, but my claim is also that the polynomial degree of the residue is just the spin of the particle. Um, you can also see this from Feynman diagrams, but I'm not going to discuss it. So, um, um, the residues are polynomial in S, and so this gives me a uh, particle also of spin.
and um, I seem to not have one of my slides, but uh, one of my uh, pages, but that's fine. Um, because I'm basically done. Um, so the picture you get here is that for, um, <coughs> um, you get these kind of poles in the, in, the, in the scattering amplitude, precisely when uh, alpha of t is an integer. So very, very roughly speaking, you get a picture that looks a bit like this. Um, <coughs> Let me suppose that alpha of t is a alpha 0 plus alpha 1 times t. <coughs> right? And then, so in the vicinity of t equals 0, that's hopefully a decent approximation. So you plot t, you plot alpha of t. And so the picture that we now have is that for um, alpha t being an integer, an even integer, so 0, two, four, six. Um, <coughs> I get a pole in the scattering amplitude. So um, here I get some kind of bound state or resonance if it, if it moves in the complex uh, plane. Here I get some bound states and here I get some bound states. So these are, and the, the, the location of the, of the pole is of course the residue. So this is M0, M2, M4, M6. But on the other hand, when um, t is negative, this, um, 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 this thing shoots uh, the, same, the same sort of ansatz gives me the asymptotic behavior of the scattering amplitude. So here t is negative, and I can just measure the scattering amplitude. So hopefully, if you measure the scattering amplitude, you would connect this behavior, this asymptotic behavior of the scattering amplitude for large s. So the thing I should plot here is the log of t divided by log s, right? Um, because that, that should precisely give me alpha of t. And hopefully, if you plot that, then you can uh, smoothly connect this to the spectrum of, of, of resonances uh, in, in, the, in your theory. So again, um, I think it's a, it's a very nice picture. Again, it does not quite work experimentally. Uh, I think there's some plots that I found from back in the 70s when they were not so high not such high energy results available. Remember, this was something about the asymptotic behavior of the scattering amplitude. And there, it seemed to work super nicely. Of course, the picture works beautifully. But um, in reality, um, I think right now, uh, if, you, if, you, if you look at, at the scattering data for, for pions or hadrons, you don't, you don't have this nice, nice lineup. So that leads people to believe that maybe there is some other singularity in the complex L-plane. Again, all of this relies on a lot of assumptions of, of nice analyticity in the, in the complex L-plane. And this Reggie trajectory, this trajectory of, of, of particles or resonances that is associated with this singularity in the complex L-plane that you would get from asymptotic data, uh, asymptotic scattering data, is, is called the Pomeran. Um, <coughs> and I'm really not going to say much about this, but um, um, of course, you can find lots and lots of, of literature on, on this uh, hypothetical Pomeran. I just wanted to say that uh, this is the picture for um, um, that, that sort of comes out. This is the main picture, I think, that comes out of this, uh, this whole uh, Reggie theory analysis. <coughs> Any questions or comments? Richard, you want to add something? Well, the last one. Yes, I know. Yes, yes, yes. There are cuts at negative t in the complex L plane, you say. Right. And then you can almost get a more bounded by power. So what basically happens is the idea is that your roots, root ball bound states, which are up on the right, turn into 
sustaining, right? And that's a short distance bus. Right? So um, it, it's actually phenomenologically based in this good. I'm noting that when you look at the charge channel of the row, this fits very well. So I mean, it's sort of understood that it has to be like that. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure how to. I, I apologize for the people watching the recording, but uh, yeah, thanks. So you're saying. You're saying the J, okay, the complex L plane does exist. That, yes. I think I can, I, I'd like to summarize that for the recording. So yes, the, you, you're right because of, precisely because of the transformation that I wrote down involving these, the genre functions of the second kind, this complex L plane exists, right? There's no, there's no doubt about that the validity of that, of that formula. The question is what kind of, so you can write down the Sommerfeld-Watson transform. The question is what kind of beasts and monsters do you encounter if you try to open up the contour? I just did the case of a single pole. As you said, people now think they're cuts and their poles coming out of the cut. There's all kinds of, of behavior. But yes, the continuation um, does exist. Thank you for that. Um, okay, I have some time left, right? About five, 10 minutes. Okay, let me um, just say Pomeranchuk's theorem. Um, which I want to end the lectures with and um, is going to be somewhat different from what I did before, before because I'm going to consider elastic scattering, um, but now not of identical particles, but of non-identical particles. Again, scalars and real, and I'm not going to make my life complicated, non-identical particles A and B. Um, and let me also suppose that um, we are in a nice regime. So the forward amplitude T of S0, let me call this T of S from now on, um, looks a bit like this. Um, in the complex S plane, potato. Um, and of course, um, so um, there, there could be a potato. I don't, I don't, um, I don't need analyticity in the full S-plane, but I need this kind of analyticity, where it's analytic here and here. And um, of course, as we know, the AB to AB scattering sits here. And by um, crossing symmetry, um, I, I can go here. And then I get AB bar to AB bar, except that really AB bar to AB bar um, should be below the cut. So what I get here on the other side is the complex conjugate of, the, of AB bar to AB bar. Um, <coughs> so here I implicitly also assumed that the discontinuity um, of T of S as usual, we have this kind of real analyticity for um, <coughs> real analyticity. So uh, the discontinuity is two i times dimensionary part. Um, I'm not done with my assumptions. Let me add a few more. Um, uh, if the imaginary part of T as plus i epsilon uh, equals Sigma t the total AB to X cross section, AB cross, total AB cross section uh, times S. So this, um, <coughs> well, okay, this, this is for large S, so uh, S to infinity. Um, <coughs> imaginary part of T minus S minus I epsilon. What, what are you doing with T? It's forward, so I said T equals zero. Um, <coughs> this is sigma sigma dot a b bar of s times s. Um, if this thing's, um, then I'm going to assume that my cross sections behave 
like sigma, some constant sigma infinity times log to the ns, where n can be 0, 1, or 2, and uh, sigma dot ab bar equally behaves like some sigma bar infinity log to the ns. <coughs> <coughs> then, Pomeranchuk gives you some bit of information. So you have some cross section, total cross section of AB scattering to anything, and we have AB bar scattering to anything. And what Pomeranchuk says is that these two asymptotic limits have to be the same sigma infinity equals uh, sigma bar infinity. And this ties in with uh, one of the plots I. Um, Made. Again, we're going to discuss scalars, and this was for PP and PP bar scattering. But I hope you remember from the first lecture this asymptotic equivalence, or the fact that, that PP uh, total cross section and PP bar total cross section at very high energies become uh, approximately equal. Um, we can understand this very fundamentally from uh, Pomeranchuk's theorem. Um, <coughs> so, obviously, I don't have time to give you a full proof. So let me just give you a, a small proof. Um, and again, this is a theorem in quotes, and it's, it'll be a proof in quotes. And I'll, I'll tell you um, the extra assumption that we need in, in the course of the proof. So the proof is um, based on dispersion relations again. Uh, this is basically a version of the proof, the original proof of Pomeranchuk. Weinberg has given a much more generally valid proof, but I'm not going to um, discuss that because it just requires all kinds of theorems on uh, complex functions that I don't, don't really want to discuss. So let, this is the, the simple um, poor man's version of the proof. Let phi of z be t of s plus t of minus s divided by s. This is obviously an even function of s so, um, uh, sorry, it should be minus. This is obviously an even function of s. Um, so it's a function of s squared, so z is s squared. And um, what we do is we write a dispersion relation in the complex z plane for uh, phi of z divided by z. <coughs> um, but it should give us enough, so if I write it for phi of z divided by z, I should have enough subtractions, again, by, by uh, Frosser, um, to make this uh, a proper dispersion relation. So in the complex z-plane, of course, if um, I make a half circle in, one second, Pedro. If I make a half circle in s, so s goes to e to the i pi s, then z makes a full circle. z goes to e to the 2 pi s. Yes, you want to say something? Um, it's precisely because of the cuts, right? So in the complex z-plane, it looks like this. <coughs> There's some, some z not. Like I said, I do a semicircle in, in S, then I do a full circle in Z. So I put the two cuts on top of each other. And then, um, basically, um, you write that um, Uh, phi of z divided by z is uh, potato stuff um, <coughs> plus uh, 1 over 2 pi i. Um, <coughs> phi of z prime plus i epsilon minus phi of z prime minus i epsilon divided by z minus z prime minus z integral from z naught to infinity is that not this, this, this threshold where the potato ends? And then there's, of course, is that prime as well. Is it prime? And, um, well, then things become a bit more messy, and I'm not going to um, discuss this, this in, in great detail. So let me put the z on this side. So this is a new potato stuff, and then the z goes in here. z, dz prime. Um, <coughs> And um, then I'm going to take the real part of phi of z. 
So this will be the real part of whatever this thing is. And um, this, of course, um, oh, sorry, the, the 2 pi i is a pi, uh, because I already have the discontinuity. Um, <coughs> uh, no, sorry, this is, this is still 2 pi i. Um, so this real part becomes this, which basically becomes the principal value of the integral. So I get that this is whatever this is, plus um, integral 1 over pi, principal value of an integral from z0 to infinity, um, the total cross-section AB of S, which is basically the imaginary part. So this requires a bit of fiddling with, with I epsilons. Um, but you get uh, something like this. Um, Z prime, S prime, S prime, Z prime minus Z, times Z, DZ prime. And uh, if you work out what this, so now we can go to very, very large Z. And if you work out what this uh, principal value is um, using this kind of assumptions on the cross section, you find that this is um, the, SM, the infinity, the very large, uh, the asymptotic constant of the, of the cross section. So sigma infinity, um, how did I write it? Sigma bar, sigma bar infinity times um, something that is basically um, log of uh, z2. Um, let me see if I did this correctly. So these go like to s. So uh, this is log of z to the n plus 1. And so um, what you see is that the real part of phi of z, right, the imaginary part of phi, and therefore the imaginary part of the scattering amplitudes goes like, um, goes like s times log to the n of s. But the real part um, <coughs> goes like s, at least of one of the two, goes like s times log to the n plus 1 of s. <coughs> so we see that the real part of t of s t dominates the imaginary part of t of s, sorry, t of s zero. But this is something um, <coughs> that, uh, so this is true unless, of course, these two are equal, unless sigma infinity equals sigma bar infinity. And now I'm going to say end of proof because uh, I don't have a very good first principles argument for the fact that the imaginary part should dominate at very high energies. But um, if you remember from the previous lecture this, this black disk model, or if you just look at experimental results, uh, then you find that um, inelastic scattering, which is the imaginary part, really dominates at very high energy over the, over the, uh, over the real, and, and dominates at very high energy. And therefore, the imaginary part at large S is much larger than, than the real part. So if you are willing to assume that, then um, Pomeranschuk's quote unquote theorem follows. And um, <coughs> I think that's the, that's the current status of, of, of sort of the, the, the proof, hypothetical proof, or like a, a attempt at a proof of, of equivalence of this sigma infinity and sigma infinity bar. So in particular, Weinberg, I think, also needs uh, something to assume something like this. He, he, work, he has a more general proof, but I don't think he can get out of this real over imaginary part going to zero at large energies. OK, um, these were all the things I wanted to say, and my time is up. So are there any more questions? Nothing? OK. All right. Uh, thank you.